In this part of the talk, I will work on uh, one, uh, one side of uh, the research that I'm doing in the lab. My lab today is quite a big lab. I have 45 students that work on five different divisions, I will call it. I have students that are uh, working on chemist analysis, that are analyzing all the compounds uh, in the plants and also asking questions related for that. What is the shelf life of cannabis? We're making extract oil for the patient. Sherlock's web. How long it can we can have it on the shelf? So in Israel on the bottle it's written one year, you know why? Why it's written why it's written one year? Do you know? On the bottle. Or is sleeping. <laughs> because that's what the Minister of Health is asking. Nobody can check it, so why not? <laughs> in Canada it's written one one point five years. Because there they are asking for one point five years and nobody can check it. So what is the active compound that actually doing the effect? If you don't know it, how do you know if it's falling apart or not? If you can watch it, you can follow up. So part of the questions that we are asking, what is the shelf life of cannabis? How to dilute it with olive oil, with canola oil, with DMSO? We know nothing about it. We know nothing. One of the growers told me a year ago, oh, you're working with, the grower, with this grower, you shouldn't work with him. I said, why? He said, he poison, he's, he's poisoning, they are poisoning their, um, their patients. I said, why are you saying that? You know that I like him, he's a very good friend of mine. He said, you know that they put it with canola oil? I said, okay, what's the problem? He said, are you kidding me? From the day in Woodstock, we know that you can mix them with canola. I said, okay, so now Janice Joplin is the, our physician, right? <laughs> so this is the level that we are in, in this. So I have this group that are doing that. I have a group that are doing neurobiology, which we have epilepsy model, sleep model, um, multiple sclerosis, and Alzheimer. I have a group that are doing the database that I showed, and I have a group that are doing autoimmune disease. The major group in my lab is doing cancer work. And in the cancer work, actually when I did the postdoc in Canada, I, the question was how a cell that usually can't move started to move and to crawl. If we have a, a, a skin cancer, how a cell that didn't know how to move started to crawl to invade and to create metastasis. And, and my question was, what are the changes in the cytoskeleton the, the severe changes that happen in the cell that give him the ability to crawl. As I told you in, in my first talk today, my background is plant biology. And when I got my own lab in the Technion, it was under Chekhanover, the pri prize Nobel a, a, a professor, and he, he, he succeeded to get a $100 million to open like a hub called the TACC, Techno Integrated Center, and I was recruited there. So I was sitting in there with all the genius, so the Techno is like the MIT, it's all the computer scientists, genius that in 25 years old, they're already full professors. And I was there with the, this guy from the Nobel Prize guy and all these genius that said, okay, I'm dead. So I was thinking, how can I be a little bit special? How can I do something that is unique? And my problem that I didn't feel an expert for cancer. My professor in my PhD would say that an expert is somebody that knows everything about nothing. <laughs> you usually go and look on one thing. But I have a master's in biochemistry, a PhD in plant biology, a postdoc in cancer biology, which is a variety of things, but I didn't feel a, felt an expert. So I thought if I will bring the plant back to my research, it will give me advantage. After half a year of work, there was a publication by a Japanese group that showing that if you put cannabis on breast cancer, you're blocking the ability to migrate. And I was very happy. First, I was happy because they quote my paper. So as a scientist, you're always happy. But this is the way I saw it. There is something called Google Scholar that said somebody is quoting you. So I read it, and for me, it was perfect. I said, OK. This is our, these are plants. I didn't care that it's cannabis, but they are plants. It's GPCR receptors in migration. They are 
LPA, thrombin receptor, they are GPCR receptors, so I worked a lot on, with GPCR receptors. It's plant GPCR receptors, it's biochemistry, and it's affecting migration, it's affecting my babies, my proteins that I'm working on. So I started to read a, bit, a little bit about cannabis and cancer. If you write cannabis and cancer, there is more than 1,000 papers. Most of them are published in High Times. Do you know what the High Times? Yes. High from High, being Stone Times. This is the major paper uh, journal of cannabis. So as a scientist, we don't admire this kind of publication. We want in a peer review journals with impact factor, whatever. They, and there is no much of these kind of papers. But there was a group of papers from Christine Sanchez and Manuel Guzman from Spain that showing that if you treat can a cancer with cannabis, it's cause apoptosis. I don't know. I don't know how many physicians, whoever or other people, but apoptosis it's when cells committing suicide. Cellular in our body have the ability to check himself that everything is okay, and if something is wrong, he will commit suicide. Or he can get a signal saying vacant your place, committing suicide. Cancer is a given name to hundreds of different diseases. Prostate cancer, liver cancer, and breast cancer are totally different diseases. The cause is different, the shape of the cells is different, everything is different. But we call it cancer. Bob Weinberg in 1996, I think, published a paper called The Six Hallmark. He said every time that we will see this, 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 and this, we call it a cancer. The first thing, by definition, the cell is avoiding committing suicide. Even though there, there is a problem, there is a mutation, there is something dangerous, you don't want to die. You know how to avoid this. So what Christian Sanchez and Manuel Guzman showing that if you put cannabis on these cells, you're bringing them back the ability to commit suicide, <coughs> which is called apoptosis. So Christian Sanchez showed it on breast cancer, Manuel Guzman showed it on glioblastoma and prostate cancer. My problem was, that Christine Sanders uh, showed it on the same cells that the Japanese group showed on that they're blocking migration. So I'm asking myself, okay, so what are the hell they're putting on the plant? On the plant? What is the dose? They just written cannabis. And what is cannabis? Cannabis is a plant. It can be changed. I know that. Which cannabis? How I'm starting? So no, because I didn't know that, and I and I knew that there is a lot of came of ours. I came to my first student, my first postdoc, I told her, Liran, look, I brought from Canada eight types of, can of cancers. Let's take all the eight of them. Prostate cancer, liver cancer, pancreatic cancer. I will take four, you will take four. I will go to one of the growers and I will bring eight different types of cannabis. Let's make an extract and see what we are getting. Does it block migration? Does it kill the cells? Let's see in our hands how it's working. <coughs> So how we are we doing that? This is Liran growing the cells in the lab. The cell is growing in a plate like that. In a plate like that, it's between 3 million to 10 million cells, depending on the type of the cell. And what we're doing, we're taking the flowers and we make an extract. I have a PhD in plant biology. I don't have any problem to make an extract. I'm doing the extract, ethanol extraction that's uh, in, in this. And we put them on the cells. Every dot here is a cell. This is a lower magnification. So you see that every dot here is a cell. Let's say I have something like 1,000 cells. These are colon cancer cells. So we make an extract and we put on the cell this extract and we saw that it's killing all the cells. We're putting extract number two and it's kill all the cells. We're putting extract number three and we saw that it's not affecting the cells at all. We're taking breast cancer and we saw a very similar phenomenon. But when we took prostate cancer, we saw that the extra that killed the colon cancer and killed the breast cancer didn't affect the prostate cancer. The same thing with the second one. But the, one, the third one that didn't kill the colon, didn't kill the breast cancer, now is killing the prostate cancer. So there is a specificity between the types of the cannabis and, it's, and the way it's affecting the cells. When we do, we're taking a, a colon cells that are not cancerous, it's less effective. So usually people are very happy with this result. But as a cancer scientist, this is not really exciting. And the reason it's not exciting, 
We call it IC50. Every material in the world will kill cells eventually. The question, does it really in therapeutic window? So if we're taking rosemary or other herbs, okay, and we make an extract and we put on these cells, it will kill eventually the cells. I did it with my nephew that have some kind of exam in his last uh, grade of high school, and we took a uh, rosemary because I didn't want him to touch cannabis. He's touching, uh, I'm, I'm sure that he's touching, I know the guy, <laughs> but not in my lab. So we took rosemary and we put on these cells. In order to kill these cells with rosemary, extract of active compound of rosemary, we need 65 milligram per ml. If you're doing now the extrapolation, a person needs to eat 60 kilos a day. This is not a therapeutic window. In order to kill this with cannabis, we need one microgram. The meaning of that 65,000 times less than rosemary. If I'm doing this extrapolation, a person will need to take between one to two grams a day, which we already tell, told you this is the average in Israel. We know that it's not toxic. We know a patient getting it, and it's not toxic, but in the plant it's killing the cells, which make it very interesting compounds. Another thing, if I want to kill these cells with chemotherapy, cisplatin, vincrestine, thymidol, whatever, so in order to kill this one with Taxol, one of the most severe chemotherapies, I need 150 nanograms. If I'm thinking about the active compounds that I have in the one microgram, let's say THC 15%, I have the same amount that I need to kill with Taxol. So actually, I have a compound that is active, at least as a chemotherapy on the cells in the plate, that killing the cells that I know already that it's not toxic. This is crazy. So there is a huge difference between killing cells in the plate to treat a person. There is $100 million and then probably I won't succeed. I'm not saying that a person need to take cannabis in order to cure cancer. But as a scientist, this is exciting. As a scientist, now I want to ask what are the differences here? What are the differences here? And why it's so active? You need to understand that I am understanding as a scientist that, that single molecules arriving in the cells operate a signal, a cascade of signals in order to kill the cells. It must be very, very specific. And this is exciting. So what the difference between extract number two to extract number three? It's different cannabinoids probably. You send these cannabinoids for a laboratory to read and they read five. But I already told you that there is no five or just two as usually we are looking. There is at least 10 different families of cannabinoids and there is at least 144 different cannabinoids. So I'm looking on two. This is just the tip of the iceberg. How can I repeat the experiment? That's really, this two is important. So extract number two and extract number three was both high CBD, low THC, the same amount of THC is CBD, so I knew that it's not the only thing. And I couldn't do the, this work without knowing what it is. Also, there is terpenes inside. So I already showed you in the, my first talk what we did in order to bridge this gap, we developed a method to look on all the active compounds in order to be able to analyze it and to know how to go on from this one. I didn't do it, I didn't do it just because I wanted to do chemical analyzing in my lab. Extremely boring, sorry. I know that there is one <laughs> professor here that is chemist. And I don't understand what they're doing too much. But there was nobody in the world that could give me this service, and I couldn't do my own study. So, if I will go on, so what we are doing, we can grow the cells in plates like that, but we can also grow the cells in plates like that. Plates like that called 96 well plates, and in every whole year, you can do different experiments. So you can grow prostate cancer in this plate, and in every hole, put different types of cannabis put different dose, whatever. And in my lab I have this machine which is high, high throughput through a, a screening machine. So this is an incubator that gives all the things that the cell needs in order to live, but also have a very accurate microscope on top of it that can take images and move between the cells. So it can take up to 1,000 images an hour, 24,000 images a day, 
And you can get in the end all these images and learn that in well 6A, 100% of the cells commit suicide, while in, in plate, in, in well at 12C, nothing happened. So you can, after 24 hours, do a very fast screen. So I want to show you a few results from that, and because I don't have much time as we jump exactly the result, these are the images that are coming from that. But what I'm showing you here, it's very similar to what I showed you before, but now it's a stat. So every color, it's a different strain of cannabis. You can find the white, white widow that is famous, and the Michael, whatever, Harbona, okay? These are the percentage of the dead. So if I'm looking on one concentration, you see that part of the extract didn't affect the cells. Part of the extract killed 50% of them, and part of them killed more efficiently. It's very similar to what I showed you before, right? These are melanoma cells, but it doesn't matter. So now I'm asking myself, does the THC in the CBD or the one that's important in the, is this trade? So I'm ordering it by ratio of, of THC and CBD, and I see that there is no correlation at all. So I'm doing another trick. I'm purified from this strain the THC in the CBD. And I take THC and CBD purified, and I put them on back on the cells, and I see that even if I'm putting 20 times more than I have in these strains, it's not affecting the cells. So, or it's not the THC, or it's not the THC alone. Sorry, THC and CBD. Or it's not the THC and CBD, or it's not the THC and CBD alone. Maybe it's the entourage effect, I don't know. Another problem that we have, as I told you, cancer, it's a given name to hundreds of different diseases. And even in the same types of cancer, we have many types, subtypes. So in the breast cancer, we have more than 20 subtypes of ca breast cancer. So if I'm looking now, every, ca every couple here, it's a different types of cancer. So let's look again on colon cancer. On this colon cancer, I have one, two, three, four, five different extracts that are very useful to kill the cells. On this colon cancer, I screen more than 600 different types of cannabis, nothing affected. So even the same types of, can of cancer have differentiation. And again, as a cancer biologist, it's not surprising. We know it's different mutation, different pathways. So how to do the research? So we said, okay, let's look what we call personal medicine. Let's look inside. Let's take one type of, can of cancer with one type of mutation and look just on that. So let's say that we're taking now breast cancer, BRCA1 mutation, and all the cells that were BRCA mutation, I won't get into the details, I will say that the blue one are cells without mutation at all, and the yellow one is more severe, and this is like a gradient between them. And now we look how many cells survive. So if the bar is very low, the meaning we kill more cells. So you see, every bulk like that, it's a different strain. So this strain didn't affect the cell. This didn't affect, this didn't affect, until we find one with a totally correlation to the mutation. When we find something like that, we're starting to check all the cell biology. We're taking these cells, we create a mutation. We do increase CRISPR, we create a mutation, we see that it becomes sensitive. We're taking these cells, we're doing a rescue. We're bringing back the protein without the mutation. We're doing all the cell biology. We understand that it's going to the proteasome, it's going to the mitochondria. We understand the mechanism. This is what I know to do. This is cell biology. On the other hand, I'm asking, which strain is doing that? So here, we took all the strains from the same group. You, you remember in my first talk that I told you that I can group them? So I'm taking the whole group that I have similar compounds and they see that just one strain is very affecting killing the cells, the other much less. I'm taking normal cells, the, red, the, the, the blue and the, the orange are normal cells, the red and the green they are cells with mutation and are repeating and I see that again it's killing just the mutation. So now I'm going to mice model. I'm creating these mutations in mice model, and you see these are treat, not treated uh, mice. These are tumors from not treated mice, and these are tumors that coming from three weeks treatment with this extract. You see how it's reduced the size of the tumors. So I'm creating this cancer. 
coming back to the cannabis, what are the compounds that are doing that effect? I have 100 different compounds. Do I need all of them? Do I need one? My slogan to my students is, I want the minimum compound that doing maximum effect. I don't care if it's one, five, seven, or 17. I want to know. I want to be able to tell to a grower in Slovenia, this is what you need in order to treat the patient. I want to tell to the grower in Canada, these are the compounds that you need to look for in order to treat this patient. Otherwise, it's meaningless. To say white widow is very useful, it's meaningless. A, a, a company in in uh, in United States, what was it, Stipio, took white widow from 20 different growers and showed that it's not even the same genetics. They all call it the same name using different cannabis. So to say white widow, it doesn't help anyone. I need to know what are the compounds that reducing the tumors? What is working? But again, I have a lot of them in this extract. So what are we doing? We're taking this extract and we're running on the machine. HPLC preparative doesn't mean, matter what it's doing. But what it's doing is separating these molecules. And you can tell the machine, we have 100 molecules. Take the first 25, put it in the first tube. Take the second 25, put them in the second tube. Take another 25, put in the third tube. We fractionating the oil. And we're taking every fraction like that and coming back to the cells. And now it's, a, again, cell viability. How many cells survive? So if the bar is low, the meaning it's kill more cells. The red one is the whole extract. And every other one is the fraction. So you see that one fraction is killing the cells in a similar way as the whole extract. So I eliminate 75% of the compounds already. I left with 25. I'm taking these 25 that's working and fraction them again. Now I'm seeing five, 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 and five. And I'm going back to the cells until I'm finding the minimum compounds that are doing maximum effect. In that specific mutation, that specific cancer, we've, we define three molecules, just three, that killing the cells as the whole extract. So if I'm purifying these three and I'm putting them on the, on, the, on the cells, it's killing the cells exactly the same of the whole extract. But if I'm taking one of them out, it's not working anymore. So it's true, it's not one. But it's not the whole compounds. It's just three. And we already know why. Because one of them is binding TRPV1 receptors and release calcium flux in the cells that cause kind of a secondary signals. One of them binding CB1 and operate the MAP kinase. We know that they are binding different receptors, operating different signals. If you remember my first talk today, it's a complicated action that happened from three compounds. If you will take one of them out, it's not enough in order to see the action. So if I'm looking on the all the other extracts that I use, that I saw that the similar, every one of them is missing one of these compounds. So I need the three of them. But one of them, one of these compounds, it's even unknown. 331-18B. As you understand, my chemists in my lab are very novel and very <laughs> have a, a great names, okay, for the new compound. So this compound is even unknown. If I wouldn't be able to look inside and to measure it and to know that it's there, one time it will work, one time it won't work. One time I will think that it's working and the other time it's not and I wouldn't know if it's because the student mixed the tubes or maybe it's because I lost one of these compounds. So this for me, it's like a proof of concept. And we need to be able to look in this accuracy in order to know how to treat our patient. Doesn't matter if I'm showing you now cancer or if you were talking about Crohn if we're talking about epilepsy, maybe epilepsy is a little bit different because we know that CBD is extremely important. But in other cases, sleep disorders, anxiety, 
We know it's not a single compound. But if we want to know what are the compounds, we want to be able to dose it and to give the patient a treatment that's repeatable all the time. So now the question, does cannabis is good always? As I already told you, God gave us, gave us this plan to cure the, the world, right? <laughs> so, two years ago, I got a grant to review a grant from a company that want to give to Australian a, a scientist money in order to do a research on immunotherapy. Immunotherapy today is like the, the, the tip of the treatment in cancer. Immunotherapy, the meaning that we are teaching our immune system to attack the tumors. So usually tumor, because it's a self-cell, that become crazy. Our body don't recognize that there is a problem, it's not attacking it. On the other hand, the tumor is using our immune system in order to live. They're bringing oxygen, they're keeping them from other uh, things. He's using the immune system. But today, in specific kind of diseases, in specific types of cells, we can teach the immune system and say, hey, look, this is not cells. He fooling you, go and kill him. And the immune system will go and kill. This is immunotherapy. So in this grant, this professor wrote that she will use the immune therapy that she's using, PDL1, doesn't matter, plus cannabis, plus cannabis, plus cannabis. Okay, and I was reading this grant and said she don't understand anything. She didn't review any paper of cannabis, she don't understand. Somebody offer her money, she just put on the ground cannabis, 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 and, and submit it again in order to get this money. But I was a very young scientist, running for every penny, and I feeling very, felt very bad to, to say, don't give it to this scientist. So I went to Gilbert Sella, Professor Gilbert Sella from Rambam Hospital, which was the head of the oncology department, and said, Gil, <coughs> I have a problem. I know that cannabis is balancing down the immune system when it's in hyperactivity. That's the reason it's good for uh, inflammatory bowel disease like chronic colitis, it's good for autoimmune disease, because it's balancing down the immune system when it's in hyperactivity. <coughs> so I'm telling you, I have a problem. So cancer patients, what we need their immune system we give them cannabis to treat palliative care, to reduce nausea, to increase appetite, to reduce pain. In Israel, we have around 14,000 patients, cancer patients, that getting cannabis under prescription to reduce pain, no, uh, nausea, and increase appetite as a, treat, as a palliative treatment for, uh, for chemotherapy. So I came to Gilbert and said, hey Gil, I have this problem. We are giving cannabis to this patient, does it make a problem? And more than, if we're giving immunotherapy, which need to elevate the immune system to attack the tumor, is it fine to give them cannabis? So Gil was thinking, he said, I never thought about it, but I have many patients that are taking immunotherapy drugs and cannabis, let's check them. So we did a research that was published yesterday, so from yesterday it's on PubMed, that following up 150 different patients, we didn't affect the treatment, we just took all the patients that Gil Barcella had, Professor Gil Barcella, and divided them by all the patients that getting immunotherapy, and divided by patients that getting immunotherapy just immunotherapy and patients that are getting immunotherapy, but also as cannabis. So we have 80 patients that took just immunotherapy, and 70 patients take immunotherapy and cannabis. And what we saw, let's let's focus on that one. It's it's two types of uh, cancer cells, uh, cancers. One is melanoma, one is lung cancer, and two types of of uh, drugs. If we look in, on melanoma cancer patient. The possibility, the percentage that this drug, this immunotherapy will help the patient, will improve the parameters of the cancer is 40.6%.
But if they're taking cannabis with it, it's reduced to 10%. And this is a clinical trial. This is not observ observational. It's with blood tests, with everything that we can check. So now we're doing a bigger clinical trial to check does it matter on the strains? Does it just high CBD, just THC? Because in this patient, we didn't affect what they're taking. They took different strains. So the biggest population took, the, 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 they took many, many different types of cannabis. So I can't say that this 10% that work, what they took. Maybe why it's affecting them. Maybe there are strains that are not affecting. But the bottom line, as a physician, that giving Ketruda, that giving PDL1 inhibitors, that giving immunotherapy, you need to know that it may be in the day that you're giving them that your patient is better not to take cannabis. So, the bottom line, what I want to say, I think that cannabis should be in the hands of the physician. I'm not a physician, I'm a biologist. But I'm teaching in the med school. The medical students are much, much better than biology students. In the, at least in the Technion. Sorry for that, I'm a biologist. It's the best students, at least in Israel, they are the best students that we have. They're learning seven years in order to be a physician. And then another two years, how you call it? One year stage, five years. One year stage and five years in? Residency. Residency. All together, 13? No, no. 13 years, no, yes, yeah, six and seven. Years. Two years of subspecial. Yeah. Leave me alone, okay? <laughs> Something like 10 years in order to learn on how to treat the patient better. And this is not a game. If we think that these compounds are interfering with very important system in our body, the endocannabinoid system, me and Tanya in the morning said how much it's important, we need to teach in the medical school then, but if we were interfering with it, oh no, this is a plan, it's fine. Are we kidding ourselves? If it's interfering with our system, very important system in our body, a physician needs to learn how to treat and to use it as a medicine. If it's recreational, we want to use it, fine, I don't care. If we prescribe a prescription for a patient, it must be on somebody that understands interaction with other medicine, understand all the wellness of the, of the patient. If the patient has heart problems, maybe shouldn't give these strains because it's increased her be is heart beating. We must, it's our responsibility to learn better and to know how to treat our patient better. I don't know if this is the bottom line. Maybe we'll find in other studies that it's not like that, it's not like that. I saw many, many things in science, but I'm sure that this plan is affecting our body in a very strong way, for good and for bad. Uri, do you know any medicine that's doing just good? With no side effects? With no side effect? No. So what, this is different? We call it a medicine, medical cannabis. It's not different. A physician, when a patient is coming to him, need to measure, to say, okay, this is the problem, what is the best thing that I can give him? Does cannabis is the best treatment for pain? The answer is no. It's not the best treatment for pain. But it should be in the toolbox of the physician to know how to treat it. The physician, with, when the patient is coming, need to check the patient to say, does this the best treatment? And if not, to give something else. Somebody just asked me 20 minutes ago, but it's the patient rights to take what he wants. Really? When I'm coming to emergency room, I'm telling the physician what I want to take? Can I get morphium every time that I want? It's not my rights, it's a plant. Morphium comes from a plant. Why can't I get it free? It's my rights, no? No, when you're going to a physician and prescribing a, a, a prescription for you, it's not your rights anymore. It's still under democracy, but it's not your rights anymore. We mix in between medicine to recreational. We mix in between medicine to now some kind of game, a plan, making fun. If it's a medicine, let's act, let's treat it as a medicine. And I don't care what the physician, I trust Johnny and I trust Uri to take the right decision. It's not my 
role to do that, but I trust them. I don't trust a grower that didn't finish high school, and I don't trust a grower that is, did agriculture all his life. My father was in agriculture. I admire my father, but he can't treat a patient. So this is my philosophy, and again, thank you very much. Many of the papers about cancer therapy with cannabis are talking about CBD, THC, ratios. So after listening to your bottom lines, this is all BS. No, two things. First of all, a lot of the work's done on in glioblastoma, and in glioblastoma, at least from these studies, and I believe them, and I repeat it a little bit in my lab, THC and CBD are the major compounds in glioblastoma. In other studies, this is the only thing that under the light of these scientists. So they don't, they don't see the 331A and don't three other things, that they, what they have, and this is why it's published. So my answer that yes, in, in the other studies, I don't think the THC and CBD are, are the most important ones. In glioblastoma, yes, and most of the studies are done on them. It's Manuel Guzman, Kirti Sanchez, there is a group of scientists that did it. These are the major publications that we have. So, so from, from here, it does work? Yes. Yeah. 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 In, in something like 13 different publications, they show that in glioblastoma, THC can cause apoptosis, CBD can cause apoptosis, but together there is a synergism, it, it's working better. They show it in, in the animal model and even in one clinical trial of 13 patients. And I repeated it in, in my studies and I showed, I, I saw similar results. The, the reason I didn't work on them too much because there are 13 publications already, so. So uh, when I was uh, doing the literature, because of a friend of mine, uh, the rack positive, yeah, some of the papers said high CBD is important. So you, you say it should be one component, not the CBD. Where? Again, in drug positive uh, breast cancer? In breast cancer, um, in breast cancer, Christine Sanchez showed in few work that <coughs> high CBD is important. In the last work, she showed the acid form of high CBD. In my work, I showed, I saw the different mutation is affecting different, so there is a diversity between hair plus, hair plus uh, mutation, or a prostate, a, a progesterone sensitive, or estrogen sensitive, so there is a different types of, subtypes of uh, breast cancer, and, and in each type, different uh, strains affect them, and I don't have the depth that I have in, in the results that I showed here. Question because I still don't quite understand your last thing. Uh, the CBD is known to be uh, CBD. Is this 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 patient took mostly high THC strain. There were just two patients that took high high CBD strains. Uh, well, that was which cancer was that? It was a uh, one was a uh, melanoma and one was a uh, lung cancer. You're talking about the immunotherapy. I'm talking now about the immunotherapy. Yeah. I have some basic problems that actually CBD is immunosuppressant in general. Right. And that's why also a medical community in the United States was very much against using cannabinoids in anti-cancer because they did not believe it because you should not immunosuppress the patient exactly. because then cancer will spread. Okay. Now they invented this PDL1 and CTL4 or other inhibitors that inhibit tumor from, uh, that actually uh, makes tumor vulnerable for the T cells, for right. the lymphocytes. And now you give them CBD, and CBD is anti, uh, is uh, suppressing lymphocytes, is still immunosuppressant, or how does that yeah, work? Yeah, that's exactly the result. It's immunosuppressant, for that reason it's blocking the activity of the immune system, that it's interfering with the drug, interfering with the immunotherapy. Yeah. It's not helping. It's it's not good. It's interfering. It's interfering. Would you like yeah. to comment on that? Just a moment, Johnny. Doctor Gould, please. I, I didn't got the, the question yet. I don't <laughs> understand the question. No. Well, why is then? Uh, what is the mechanism? Yeah. I don't know. I just because uh, you should boost the immune system, and you do it by uh, adding the inhibitor and. Right, so you boost, the, you boost the immune system now blocking with CBD. Yeah. So it's interfering with the action. Right. 
No, it's bad. It's bad for cancer. <laughs> what? No, you it's bad for the patient. It's what good for the for the right. cancer bad for the patient usually. Well, uh, we can talk. Later. Okay. Yes, please. For, for this uh, slide, is this uh, high THC cannabis? Or yeah, it's high mostly high THC cannabis, but part of the strain was half and half, part of the strain was high THC, and part of the strain was high CBD. But because it was, there were 70 patients that took a lot of different strains, we don't have staff for anything. It's just all over. So I couldn't do anything. I tried to, to gather them in groups, whatever it was. The group was too small and they took too many, too many varieties, so we couldn't do this. Now we're doing a bigger clinical trial in which we know what the patient is exactly taking and, and I, have, I hope to have a better result. Johnny wants to elaborate. Yeah. Well, Johnny don't like that we said something bad on the cannabis, always. So you need to comment on that, it's not true. Okay, that, that's not true. <laughs> and the thing is that we have to think and consider things more critically. And uh, biases are expressed in various uh, approaches to this issue. First of all, uh, just as a comment, there's not something of upregulating or downregulating immune system uh, in, uh, that can be uh, described in such simple terms because it is a very complex system with multiple interactions and interrelations. So sometimes you can upregulate something and if, uh, uh, find all kinds of effects which are neither up or down or, or around. Now, in the context of this uh, observation, there are many parameters that have to be taken into consideration, and one of the problems is that we fail to uh, identify and acquire uh, data that are already out there. Partly because of my, uh, partly my it's uh, my fault perhaps, because I have several patients who have simultaneously received uh, high doses of uh, cannabis with uh, such immunotherapy. And as I mentioned before, the results were outstandingly uh, impressive. But, but this, now, is, this is what we call anecdotal, because anecdotal, this is the 10%. The, the problem that when you're showing 40% and 10%, still there is 10% that it was fine. But Johnny, I, I, I follow up 200 patients that are taking Greek sips on well, okay? One of them had a success. The meaning of that, that it's half percent success. But in Facebook, when you have 6,000 patients that are taking it, every 200, you have 20. And 20 make tons of noise in Facebook. It saves my life, it saved my life, yes. But the medicine that work for half a percent is a, it's a lousy medicine. Yeah. So I'm not... This is anecdotal. Yeah, no. It, the truth is, as always, somewhere in between, because I'm not disputing the methodology of surveying large groups of patients and receiving uh, certain forms of treatment and arriving at conclusions. This is relatively a small number. You don't know whether the patients who received the cannabis were actually the patients who anyway were doing poorly and therefore they received the patient, the cannabis, to begin with because they were going downhill. So there are all kinds of odd explanations. I mean, it's not, to evaluate something like this systematically, we have to beware of doing half-baked science and taking small groups and rather either uh, pay attention to outstanding examples or do a prospective uh, study uh, in an orderly fashion so that you have more confidence in the, in the results. The anecdotal observations are not to be uh, ignored. If a patient was going downhill while taking a, a, a Keytruda uh, and practically uh, uh, going into hospice care, and after he starts on this treat, uh, on using this uh, extract, be, may it be whatever it is, and all of a sudden the tumor starts regressing, and I see him a year and a year and a half after that, with outstanding uh, response of the tumor, it is not something that can be brushed aside as an anecdote. It is something that deserves uh, serious attention and uh, an attempt to interpret it and to see if you can study it systematically. So, 
I don't know. It's it's not all that simple as it, as it appears. I think, personally, uh, as I see it, method, if you want to do something methodically, then you have to do it methodically all the way. And if you do it in between, then it usually will serve uh, the, the ideologists on one side or the other. Either, either it's in their favor and then they'll say, oh, it's great, or it's against their opinion, and then, then, then they'll say it's a lousy result. Johnny, did you have the time to read the paper? I've heard about it already from Gil several times. Why did you read the paper? I've seen the paper. Uh, I, I didn't do the, the study, but I know the paper. I, think. Daniel? I have just one question. This fractioning that you showed that was done for cancer has, been for, has done also for autism? No. This fractioning that we would narrow down to a few substances that are really vital in the cancer? The answer is no. For in the autism, I don't have a, a model, an animal model for that. And uh, actually we have, but it didn't work uh, good enough. And uh, the parameters are very different parameters. And I'm not doing fraction and going to treat the kids with the fractions. So the answer is no. So we don't know which substances are important or not? No, Just I don't know. based on the profile, you can I don't guess. Know. Oh. There is a question in here? Yes. CBD is functions the same no matter what the source is, right? Like it's whether it's synthetic or it's produced from one plant or another. If it's pure CBD, then it has the same function in all models. That's I mean uh, not in all models, but in the particular model, it will function the same way no matter the source. This is a question or a yeah, I, this is I just want to make sure that the, I am I we're clear on that. I'm I'm a chemist. I'm a biochemist. Compound is a compound is a compound. Okay. So if it's if it's synthetic, but it's not exactly as the phyto compounds, call it in a different name. Okay. The difference between CBD to THC is one small change, but we call it THC and CBD. The difference between THCA and CBDA is different of OH, less than one molecule of water. Okay, so if something is changed in the molecule, we call it in a different name. Yeah. If it's the same molecule. And you're sure you're going to NMR and you're doing everything in the same molecule? It's the same molecule. Okay, so, so, the, I mean, so this is the question of the, I mean, the, the more important one at least. Um, if you, for example, the, the studies um, in epilepsy patients, they were mostly using CBD. So the consistency of the finding is quite striking, right? I mean, the, everybody was seeing more or less that 50% of patients with pharmacosis in epilepsy would have a 50% increase in. Uh, you know, plus or minus, but it was the same finding. But what you were saying in uh, for the cancer patient was that this specific, um, you know, profile of a certain, um, you know, extra extract from a plant would make a huge difference whether in whether it would, you know, do something or do nothing, or it even, you know, actually uh, damage the, the cells or you know, damage the patient, for example. So if we go from pure CBD to a natural compound for treating epilepsy patients, is this something that we need to consider as well? And should this worry us, uh, you know, in the sense that we should really be very careful in what this uh, natural, you know, extracts will contain, because it could be that um, the natural compounds would actually, actually even um, possibly damage the patient, not um, help them really. So, yes, as I said, in epilepsy, CBD is a major compound that reduces seizures. Probably there are other small compounds that are changing, and, and Uri and other people, and, and David showed that, that if you're taking CBD alone, you need higher doses, dosage, and you're taking CBD from the plant, with the plant, because probably there are other compounds that are uh, doing kind of uh, uh, changes. In other diseases, it's usually not a single compound, what we see. When we're taking single compounds, not doing the, the right effect. So yes, it's kind of a combination. Again, a little bit about cannabis. People are using cannabis more than 5,000 years. Okay, part of my friends are using cannabis more than 20 years and I've accept hurt their uh, family life. It's not changing them too much. So we know that it's not toxic. We know that the side effect is not a severe side effect. You feeling uh, high, uh, maybe you less concentrate, maybe your memory is not the best, but when you stop it, you're coming back and uh, whatever. So, does it dangerous? No, it's one of the less toxic 
uh, uh, materials. I know uh, uh, really, really, really minor cases that people died from cannabis. But so what is the reason? Non-existent. Why? What? Non-existent. Yeah. Again, Johnny, non-existent. <laughs> cannabis is doing just good. No. Yes. Finish your question, please. Yeah, so, are you worried about giving cannabis to uh, as a last patient if you know why we give the right dosage? But I will be worried that when using uh, natural products, you might even get some, you know, detrimental effects on the patient. So, you, I mean, you would give him the same amount of CBD, but then the, the combination of other cannabinoids would, you know, fail in the treatment because of, you, you just don't know what those other cannabinoids are doing. The so I, I don't know, but again, today the treatment is with the whole extract and there the knowledge. We know from the patient with which, which plant, which types of plants, helping for what. These are, this is the, the knowledge that we absorb. To take now THCVA and to give it to the patient, I don't have any clue what he's doing. But to give these strains, to give EP1 to the patient with epilepsy, I know how it's affected. So still the knowledge is with the whole plant. And to take single ones, you need to know, go step by step through the uh, clinical trials, phase one, phase two, phase three, uh, toxic, toxicity and everything. It's, a, it's at least seven years work. In these seven years, we're treating our patient with the whole plant. So this is reality. The reality that we, we don't have single compounds. We have THC CBD. We don't have ma many other single compounds to treat. We don't have 3318B uh, purified when we, we can treat a patient. So we using the whole extract. Does it, does it dangerous? Almost not. We need to learn that if a patient is a complicated patient taking other medicine, how it can interact and others. But in general, I don't think it's dangerous. I apologize. I have to interrupt. Uh, thank you very much, sir.